The following information provides evidence-based guidelines on how to properly perform an intubation via video laryngoscopy. This video pairs with the attached fluency. The pre-procedure section will only cover exceptions to those mentioned in the direct laryngoscopy video. Please refer to the direct laryngoscopy video for full pre-procedural preparation. Tracheal intubation via video laryngoscopy should be considered under the following circumstances. A difficult airway as a result of limited direct visualization as a rescue intubation device and when limited cervical mobility is preferred or required. Contraindications to video laryngoscopy are the same as direct laryngoscopy. In addition, if there is an excess of oral pharyngeal secretions or blood, indirect visualization via video may be impaired. This page contains a list of abbreviations used throughout this video. The pre-procedure section contains several steps that need to be completed before bringing the patient back to the OR. These steps are very important for the patient's safety as the decided anesthesia plan will be based on a review of the patient's chart and of their physical assessment. Again, the direct laryngoscopy video covers all pre-procedure steps, including Ms. Maid's in greater detail, so please refer to it for more comprehensive information. While most of this airway section correlates with direct laryngoscopy, what is unique to video laryngoscopy, or VL, is the use of a monitor for indirect visualization of the airway and the therefore necessity to turn it on prior to use. This is to ensure the screen and camera are fully functional and have sufficient battery life. A specialized rigid stylet is also used for intubation via VL and should be inserted into the ETT. Like intubation via direct laryngoscopy, a 10 ml syringe should also be attached to the pilot balloon. Be sure to maintain universal precautions. The provider should at minimum be wearing a surgical cap, a surgical mask, and gloves once hand hygiene has been performed. When the patient arrives to the OR, it's necessary to participate in a timeout and confirm the patient's ID with at least two identifiers. Appropriate monitors should be placed on the patient to obtain baseline vitals. If there's no limitations on neck mobility, now is a good time to put the patient into the sniffing position by extending their head and flexing the neck. This aligns the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes which optimize glottic visualization. However, if a patient cannot tolerate cervical manipulation, intubation success may be increased with the use of the video laryngoscope. Next, pre-oxygenate the patient by turning the FiO2 to 100% at 10 or more liters per minute for several minutes until the ETO2 is 90%. At this point, perform a final pre-induction assessment of both the patient and their vitals. If satisfied, induction medications can now be given. Here's a list of some commonly used perioperative medications. There's a lot of content on the screen. Please feel free to pause and review. Anesthesia induction is first confirmed by apnea. Look for an absence of chest rise, mask condensation, and end tidal CO2. Then assess the eyelash reflex. If absent, tape the eyes closed to avoid a corneal abrasion. Now that the patient is apneic, mask ventilation is required. Before beginning, slightly close the APL but keep the setting less than 20 to avoid gastric insufflation. Confirm proper ventilation via bilateral chest rise and a consistent end tidal CO2 tracing. Once the ability to mask ventilate is confirmed, a baseline train of four must be checked. Then administer the appropriate neuromuscular blocker and continue mask ventilating. Required mask ventilation time varies based upon the drug onset. Jaw relaxation and a decreased amount of force needed to squeeze a reservoir bag will begin to be noticed. After sufficient time and jaw relaxation occurs, 
A second train of four must be done to confirm intubation readiness. With sufficient anesthetic depth and paralysis, scissor the patient's mouth and insert the VL blade midline. Directly visualize it until it's past the tongue before looking at the screen. With the tongue in the submandibular space, look for anatomical landmarks and be sure to verbalize them to your preceptor. Once the glottic opening is identified, carefully insert the endotracheal tube, again initially under direct visualization to avoid tissue trauma. Then look back on the monitor to confirm its passage through the vocal cords. After a traumatic introduction of the endotracheal tube past the vocal cords, withdraw the stylet and advance the endotracheal tube to a proper depth. Here's a list of generic guidelines. The final decision should be based on what's best for the individual patient. Next, inflate the pilot balloon, then connect the endotracheal tube to the circuit. Once that's completed, proceed to confirm proper placement. Confirmation methods are listed here and must be verbalized. They include equal and bilateral chest movement, condensation inside the ETT, equal and bilateral breath sounds, and adequate and consistent entitl CO2 tracing that's present for greater than three to five breaths. If the intubation was not successful, recognizing the need to forego the attempt and resume mask ventilation is also a crucial step. After the endotracheal tube has been properly placed, turn on the selected potent inhalation agent, decrease fresh gas flows, choose a proper ventilation mode, and initiate mechanical ventilation. Secure the endotracheal tube at the appropriate depth with tape. Finally, document the procedure.